speaker is Charlie Marks. Thank you for having him here. He's a rising senior at Harvard College. Thank you for applying for graduate programs. Uh, I guess we're going closer. Thank you all for having me here. Uh, I'm a rising senior at Harvard College, uh, and I'm going to be presenting work on uh, disentangling influence uh, with these wonderful folks down here. Uh, so uh, about a year ago, I was working with a group of oceanographers, and we had a data set of about 100,000 images of the deep sea. Uh, and as it currently was, uh, we were, or humans were trying to annotate these images for things like biology, asking questions like, uh, is there coral in this image? Uh, is there um, tube worms and things like that? Uh, and this takes a lot of time. So what we were asking is, can we have computer vision do this for us? Um, and what we found was that uh, on the training set, we were able to do pretty well. Uh, and within dives of the autonomous vehicle, where we had already seen images, it was able to do pretty well. But in, in new dives, um, it wasn't able to transfer those to those new domains very well. So we're interested in like, why were we seeing this poor domain transfer. And we started to be curious whether um, our model was actually learning what we were interested in or whether it was learning some lazy proxy, such as like on dives where there isn't much coral. It instead just says, ah, this was the water quality this day. And I'm just going to say, if I see that water quality, there's no coral. But we, as domain experts, know that that's not actually some, a correlation that we can trust in the population. Um, so we're interested in like, what information our model is learning on, even if uh, our data is not directly, or that's not a direct feature in our data. Um, and we quickly realized that this is uh, a similar problem that we're trying to answer often in fairness, right? So we're trying to audit um, the scenario of uh, when there's proxies for things that we're interested in. So in, um, for example, like zip code is a proxy for race. Um, and we're trying to tr understand like, what is driving this decision uh, and this notion of indirect influence. Um, so in a case like redlining, we're curious, like, is something like race um, indirectly influencing my decisions? Uh, and how I might start to understand uh, whether or not that's happening. OK. Um, so in general, there's a couple ways, right? So I guess like, our general question is what we're trying to figure out is uh, we have a model, and we have an example in which it's making a prediction. And we're trying to understand how is it doing this. OK. There are a couple ways we can think about this question. Uh, the first natural way to think about it is what we're going to call direct influence. So we're going to say, is the feature P used when I'm making my prediction? Right? Um, so in this example, I have a decision tree. right? And if I ever come across a node where I go a different direction based on my value of P, and I would make a different prediction depending on which way I went, I'd say maybe I think P is having a direct influence. right? It's changing my prediction. Um, and so for example, like in a decision tree, we can think about is, is it hitting a node in uh, a neural network? We might think about gradients. And there's other methods in different contexts where uh, we can think about what direct influence might mean. Uh, the other notion we might be interested in is indirect influence. Um, so, and this notion we're asking is the feature P used by the model, or additionally, is a proxy for the feature P used by the model. So in this decision tree, right, the feature P doesn't appear. But there's a feature x2. So instead of asking if p is greater than 1, we're asking if x2 is greater than 2. But in general, x2 is about equal to 2p. So this is, in, in some sense, a similar decision tree. right? And it's, like, it's using similar information. And the information from p might still be determining decisions, even though p isn't directly being used. OK. So this is the kind of, the kind of question we're interested in seeing if we can tackle. So what our goal is, for each instance in our data set, we'd like to quantify the indirect influence of each feature uh, on the prediction of a model. So what that might look like is like for something like here, right, we have an instance where like feature one is causing it to be slightly greater than otherwise would have. Feature two is doing you know, slightly less than. Uh, and we'd like to be able to do this for each instance. And then across the data set, we can see you know, on, you know, in general how our feature is being treated, uh, in addition to like on specific instances, um, what's kind of happening behind the scenes with this indirect influence. Um, so I'm interested in asking, like, is there discrimination? Uh, what are the pathways that result in that? Like, what are the proxy variables? Uh, and what kind of examples specifically in the data set are subject to discrimination? Um, so with, within a group, right, um, some individuals might be bearing more of the burden of discrimination than other individuals. OK. Um, so this can be a computationally difficult problem, right? Because it involves understanding the relationships between different variables. So if we're trying to understand if something is uh, being influenced, or a decision is being influenced via proxy, we first have to understand what are the proxies and all of these higher order relationships, which can be difficult. So what we'd like to do is reduce this difficult indirect influence problem to a simpler, in some cases, direct influence problem. Because there's other people who have done great work in that area. So if we can kind of leverage their work and translate our problem to their problem, our problem gets easier. So um, some of this great work here, we're interested in saying, like, can we turn our problem into their problem? 
OK. So the general thing we're going to try to do is we're going to take this original problem where we have a protected feature P and a bunch of other features X. And we're trying to look at the indirect influence on some model, which is making a prediction Y hat. And we're going to say, can I, can I swap my features out for a new set of features P and X prime, where the features X prime are, are similar to X, except uh, X prime is independent of P. Right? So there's, there's no relationship between P and X prime. And because of that, we're going to have to change our model to M prime so that it will make the same predictions on PX prime as M would have made on PX. Uh, and now instead of getting Y, we're going to Y hat, we're going to get Y hat prime, which we're going to hope is going to be like about the same prediction because we want this to be on the same model. And we're going to argue that direct influence on this model is the same as the original indirect influence. Okay. So the kind of main driving methodology behind what we're going to do rests on disentangled representations. Um, so Rich Zemmel mentioned this uh, a little bit y yesterday. Um, and what disentangled representations try to do is they look at recovering independent factors of variation from dependent features. Right? So we say that in the world, behind our data, there's these independent knobs right, that change the world state. And I can turn one of them, and it will change the features I get. And I don't have to change the other knobs behind the scenes. Right? So there are these kind of independent settings in the world. Um, and they're going to give rise to our dependent features. Right? So to talk about this, um, we're going to walk through an example and then formalize it a little bit. So um, in our simplest example world, we're going to say we have a 5 by 5 grid, and this is the world. Uh, and on our grid, we have a ball, which can take any of four colors. And the different world states are the different positions and colors of the ball. So one world state might be right here, where it's at like the position 3, 1, and it takes the color red. Right? Um, okay. So we say, if we say that x, y, and c vary independently, Right? We can say we have these independent factors of variation, x, y, and c. And from them, we make some observations, because we have some sensors of this world. Right? But we see as soon as we've made these observations, we lose this independence. Right? Our features are very dependent. Right? Um, so now what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to make, generate a disentangled representation, which can recover from this representation some new representation, which observes the independence of the independent factors of variation. OK. So, kind of formalize that setting. We're going to say the set of world states is a set W, which we're going to compose as a Cartesian product. And we have a group of world state transitions, which we're going to compose as a direct product of subgroups. And we're going to say that the group G acts on the set W. And what a group action says is pretty much an element of the group G, when you act on the set W, it'll just mix up the elements. It just permutes them. right? And we're going to say that this group action is disentangled if the two subgroups of G each fix the component of W that doesn't correspond to them. So we'll say that G1 only acts non trivially on W1, and likewise for G2 and W2. Right? So we can kind of think about this like world state transitions as simply the way that G1 acts on W1 and G2 acts on W2. Right? So as an example here, we could say, like, let's say I have the, the action right, of moving to the left two and changing colors. I'd say, OK, I'm going to move from here to here to here and go to green. Right? And I can think about that as independent of any y movement. right? I can just think about that happening independently. So all I have to think about is how am I changing the x-coordinate of this point. I don't have to think at all about what's happening at the y-coordinate, right? because they're disentangled. OK. But the difficulty is, in the, in the real world, we don't have access to these independent world states. So we have these, these modeled features. right? Um, so what we'd like to do is say, can we take these observations and recover this independence? right? So we say that a disentangled representation, which is a function all the way from the world states to these encodings, which has to pass through the observations first, will encode the world states into some independence structure. right? Um, and formally, what we're saying when we say that is that a disentangled it's a disentangled representation if uh, the group action on Z, so first it was acting on W, we're saying we're going to see, can we find a new group, group action on Z such that it also observes the same disentanglement. So Z will decompose similarly as W did. Right? And similarly, G1 only acts on Z1, and likewise for G2 and Z2. And we also need this equivariance, which um, is like kind of a consistency property, which I'm happy to go into more depth if anyone's interested. But pretty much what it says is that like F and action by G need to commute. Um, so it kind of like gives us a world state dynamic on these encoded, this encoded set Z. OK. So um, that last section was pretty much the theory of Arena Higgins and a couple other folks. Um, and so kind of we're going to bundle that up and say, can we use their work um, and extend that to figure out this problem of indirect influence? So what they're saying is, we think we can you know, formalize this notion that disentangled representations recover independent factors of variations from dependent features. And the way we're going to try to extend that is to define indirect influence 
of the feature P on the model M at the instance PX as um, instead in world state. So we're saying, OK, well, these features are functions of these world states. So now we're going to say W1 and W2 are going to be WP and WX, which correspond to the protected and unprotected world states. And we're going to say that B observes these world states and will give us features. OK, so we're saying we're going to say the indirect influence is actually happening uh, in these world states. And furthermore, these world states, WP and WX, we're going to define the, world, the protected world state to be the protected information we have. So we're saying the information we want to understand how it's being affected or how it's affecting our prediction is the information, exactly the information that's encompassed in the feature P. Okay, and that information might also be affecting the rest of the features X, right? But we're saying that there's no relationship between WX and P. Okay. Um, so when we talk about indirect influence on M of this function of WP, we can then say pretty much we can pull that into a composed function and say we're actually going to be auditing the function which is now a function of world states and it first observes and then makes a prediction. And here, WP and WX are by construction independent. So there can be no proxies, right? They are independent, so there's going to be no like, strictly indirect influence because there are no proxies. So here, indirect influence just reduces to direct influence. The only proxy for a feature is going to be itself, right? And this is something that we can try to compute. Um, so if we can find this correct model, which uh, composes um, and this like observation function B, then we can just compute the direct influence on that model. Okay, so let's start with the basic supervised learning scenario. We have a bunch of features, and we're going to have a model, and it's just going to make some prediction, right? But we're going to say, okay, well, in the background, I have these, this disentangled representation from which my features are generated, right? So somewhere up in the clouds, there's these independent factors of variation, and that's where my features are actually coming from. So I have these like these two processes, right? And I'm just going to combine them, right? I'm going to say. OK, I have one process which is going to generate my features and one which is going to make a prediction. And I'm just going to consider those one process, right? So I'm going to say I start with independent factors of variation. I'm going to do some stuff, and then I'm going to get a prediction, right? So when I combine them, I can just say, OK, I now have a model of independent, of independent features. And if I can select one of them to be my protected information, right, I can just let everything else just be the jumbled mess of other information that I don't need to be interpretable or really care about at all. I can just say it needs to be everything that is not related to my protected information. Now I have a model where I, just would look to, I can just look at the direct influence on my feature P. OK. So learning how to do this is going to take a little bit of work. Uh, we're going to do it through uh, an autoencoder, which pretty much tries to learn an identity function. So what an autoencoder does is right, you give it a vector x, and its goal is to just reproduce that vector x. But it has the task that it has to pass through an information bottleneck. So it has to take a large representation, pass it through a small representation, and get back. Right? So it's trying to densely encode that information. But we're also going to say, in your autoencoder, I'm going to try to take your latent representation x prime at your information bottleneck and see if I can find the, predict the protected information from that. And if I can, they're not independent, right? Because I've been able to reveal a way to predict p from x prime. So I'm going to trade this adversarially. I'm going to say, I don't want you to be able to predict p from my latent representation. But when I give the decoder, right, the second part of my autoencoder, direct access to p and x prime, then it should have all the information it needs to get back, right? So I'm trying to just like separate the protected information from the unprotected information. And then I'm going to pass that through the model. But now what I have is my original features, but as a function of a disentangled representation, right? So if I just compose the decoder in the original model, I can just calculate using you know, your favorite feature influence algorithm what is the direct influence on that model. And we're saying that now we can actually look at what is the indirect influence of P on the original model M. OK, so I'm going to move into some experimental results now. Um, you're going to see this type of plot a couple times. The way to read this plot is the x-axis is going to be the score of influence. Uh, and so a point far to the right means that on that point, that feature led to a result with a higher prediction. A point that's like far to the left out here says that that feature taking that value led to the prediction being a lot lower. And if it, it's red, it means that that feature took a high value there. And if it's blue, it means that feature took a low value there. So in general, features with high importance will see a lot of spread. They'll have a lot of weight away from the center. And features with low importance will just kind of be stuck at the middle doing nothing. OK. So the first experiment we did is we pretty much randomly generated um, from the uniform distribution just three latent factors, x, y, and c, independently. And then we just generated a feature vector from those deterministically. right? So we just pretty much threw in 2y and 2x. And 
we had a label x plus y, and we just handcrafted a model that just grabs the feature x from our vector, grabs the feature y, and adds them, right? So direct influence, right? So we just used an implementation called SHAP, and it correctly says what your model is doing is it's just using the features x and y. Nothing else matters. If you were to change those features, nothing would happen, right? But in the indirect influence sense, we're saying, well, 2x and 2y matter, right? Because 2x fully reveals x, which is the, like, what your model is using for its decision. So in the indirect influence sense, 2x is very important, right? So the first thing we do is we give our method a perfect disentangled representation. Because we say, we know how we generated this data. This is the relationship structure. And then can you tell me the indirect influence? And we see kind of similarly to, to the simple example over here, it's able to like correctly say, like, yeah, these six features now all have the same influence because they perfectly reveal each, each other. And the features related to C still don't matter. Right. But in the real world, we don't actually have any access to this like disentangled representation, right? This, yeah. So in, in these plots, uh, when you're trying to see the effect of one feature going all the way from here to there as you vary its value, what do you do with the other features? Do you keep them fixed or you randomly uh, choose settings? So we're not perturbing points at all. So we're saying like there are points in the data set for which x takes a low value, right? And we're just going to say, OK, one x takes a low value. So this is just like the distribution of all points in the data set kind of looking at their x value, right? So um, we're not doing any sort of perturbation, right? We're just saying like the points with, that are blue are just, they just happen to have low x values. Just projection of the data set yeah. on the different features. Yeah, yeah, the pretty much. Line is a projection on the feature. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. OK. Um, yeah, so when we don't have direct access to this, this disentangled representation, we have to learn it, right? So we see that like when we have to start learning these representations, we still get the same general idea, like it's approximating this, but like a little bit of noise creeps in um, because it starts to like, oh, is C model, does C matter a little bit in this scenario? I'm not sure. Um, so we're interested in like, understanding next, like when should we trust this audit and when should we be a little concerned that like maybe we're going to catch a case where like this point isn't being quite predicted correctly or being audited correctly. Um, so the first thing we're going to look at when we're auditing this is the reconstruction error, right? Because instead of passing x into the model, we're actually passing x hat into the model. So if x hat isn't equal to x, we're actually not auditing on quite the correct point. Um, so we can see, like, okay, when it's not able to reconstruct perfectly, that's a case where we should be a little concerned. So we can say for each point, what was the reconstruction error? And the next thing we'll look at is the prediction error, because not all mistakes are made alike. Right? There are going to be certain mistakes that in reconstruction that our model is not going to be very sensitive to. Like information that our model was ignoring, if we aren't able to reproduce it correctly, that actually doesn't really matter that much. But you could imagine there's a small error we make that our model is incredibly sensitive to. Right? And in that case, we could say, oh, our reconstruction error is not that bad. Our audit should be good. But our model was super sensitive to it. So actually, it was a big problem. Right? Um, so like one kind of like rough way to look at that is just say, like, OK, if I actually use my model to predict on these two values, how much does that differ? And the last thing we're interested in is like, did I actually successfully disentangle my representation, right? So we kind of look at this this notion of like how much of the uh, the variance of p was the discriminator, the uh, adversary able to recover. Okay, so this is pretty much guessing like or getting at the idea of like are the latent factors independent? And we'd like this uh, these all to be about equal to one, which is saying that like all of it was obscured. Okay. So one nice notion um, about this definition in this work is that we can audit features that aren't actually in the data set. Right? So in this scenario, we have a bunch of simple, simple synthetic images. So they're just pretty much uh, generated from five latent features um, deterministically. And we train a model that's just trying to like, predict whether or not the shape is a heart. And all it gets access to is the pixels of this image. Right? So it's just like given this picture of a square, and it says, is it a heart? And what we're interested in is like, well, how much does the orientation of the shape affect that? Right? Which is not something that we can directly audit because our model is not a function of that latent factor. It's just a function of these pixels. So what we're going to try to learn is we're going to ask our model, can you understand how the orientation of this, lat this latent factor relates to these pixels? So then we can kind of, through those proxies, understand how it is affecting these model's predictions. Right? So we see that. In this sense, um, it's able to, to correctly note that like, shape seems to be having slightly more importance than these other features when we're trying to predict shape, just, just through understanding the relationship of these latent factors to the pixels. OK. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I, I apologize if you, if you said this earlier. When you say shape scale orientation, 
are these things that um, are these meanings that we've imposed on the say five features in the narrow section of the autoencoder, or are these things that we've curated on the examples that you know? Yeah. So these are labels that were determined. Like it's how the image was generated. So it's like we have a data set, and for each data set, like, so it, for each instance in the data set, it has a shape, scale, orientation, x position, and y position. And using that information, it just like makes the photo. OK, so it's, it's not that we have to look at the autoencoder and try to figure out exactly. which of its features corresponds to. Exactly. We're not trying to like learn exactly that thing. So we're just saying, like, um, can, you can you pull out shape from everything else? You don't have to like pull out shape and then scale and then orientation all simultaneously. We're going to one at a time pretty much say, like, what is like the information of shape, and then what is everything else? And we're, like just that, like two. There's just two elements in our just single representation, and then we're gonna throw that out, start over, say what is the scale, what is everything else, and then that just single representation. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Okay. So then we uh, did some work with the adult income data set, uh, and we see that when we audit direct influence, uh, it seems like uh, marital status over here. Uh, has, has some importance, uh, but we see that like the label of being a husband uh, and your sex isn't that important. Uh, but then we move over to indirect influence. Uh, our audit says that like well maybe these are more important features. So in this way we hope that like our model can like raise red flags. So if you have a model and you're worried that like you don't want it to be making decisions based on these sensitive attributes, uh, it can just like you know point you to things that might be being used as proxies or being um, accessed through proxies. But this is only uh, addressing effect of single variables. This, there could be an effect of a, a combination of variables that on a single variable you will not see. It. So if I have XO of two variables, on each of them I will not see any effect. But these two variables together are very influential, and maybe I, I want to avoid it. Right. So you're talking about like intersectional things and like that, and like higher order. Right. Yeah. Right. right. So we actually we've thought a little bit about how um, we could extend the, this work to that. Uh, and if you'd be interested in talking offline, um, we we do have actually some thoughts, and it's kind of like one of our kind of um, the kind of like right up front future directions. Um, but indirect influence can capture um, some notions of higher order relationships in the sense that like as, as currently posed, because like, right, like um, it still matters, right, like the in that um, conjunction, like the value of, of each individual thing still does matter. Um, right. Yeah. So yeah, I, I'd definitely be happy to talk more about that offline because um, we've we've thought a little bit about that. And actually, uh, Rich Samal works a little bit also on like kind of like um, disentangling multiple things at once. Um, if you're interested in that work. One other question. Reading the very tiny print on this screen, I can see that the direct influence of education was large, but the indirect the indirect influence seems to be zero. So yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So we noticed that too. Um, so that was something that concerned us as well. Um, and so, if you look here, um, so we um, we're curious about that as well. And we noticed that um, it's possible actually that, that is an error, right? So we like go, go to our reconstruction error. We see like we have higher reconstruction error on education. Um, .num. So like maybe um, that is a problem. Uh, and, and furthermore, we're not always like trying to use this as a um, you know as like the, the the flag to post and say like there is a problem with this model. Right, we're we're trying to use it as maybe like a way to, you know, give people questions, to ask them, and like, and say like, hmm, I wonder if this is a problem. Um, so there are going to be cases like where like it is possible that maybe we want this this to be bigger, right? So we're going to try to to catch that in our error metrics. Um, yeah, if if that answers your question. Yeah. So for each of these different features, you're training a different autoencoder that individually disentangles this particular feature each time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we don't have to. We're not retraining the original model, but yeah, we're like training a new auto, We're training a new disentangled representation. So, so it's possible that you can find two highly correlated, or it's likely that if there are two highly correlated um, attributes, then you will say that like both of them are, um, both of them have have a lot of influence, even though they go through exactly the same path. Exactly, and that's the exact like thing we want to do, right? That's like the the property we want from indirect influence, right? Because like if you imagine that a feature is like redundantly in a data set, like you have the feature x and the feature x again. Like a model may just choose to use one of them, right? And then you say that feature is really important and the other feature is not important. But like indirect influence says they're equally important, right? Because they're the same feature. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So in conclusion, uh, we can generate indirect influence scores uh, on flexible data types uh, and for individual instances, not just across groups. Uh, and then from that, we can look at uh, the population. Uh, we can do it for features that aren't directly in the data, but that we can measure. Uh, and then we can look at individualized error analysis to try to catch things when we're like unsure 
um, about certain results um, if we can like figure out like when or not when we should or should not trust them. Um, and then so like kind of building on that also one of the limitations that is the audit can only be as good as the disentangled representation is. And right now the disentangled representations work is is quite brittle, um, right? Like these things often don't work perfectly. Um, so when there's errors in that, we're going to misunderstand our proxy relationships, and that's going to be a problem. Um, one thing that we're, we're excited about is like as this this field develops, um, our our method's quite modular, and we can get us plug in new methods for disentangled representations um, to generate our, our disentangled representation for our method. Um, so as that field develops, hopefully our our method will improve with it. Um, and it's best for uh, auditing local effects. It gets more and more difficult to understand how changing features works when you get really far away. Um, so it's kind of best to kind of like local uh, influence as opposed to like what would happen if the, um, this, feature, this uh, instance became very different. Uh, okay, so with that, uh, I'll say thank you. Uh, and here is the paper and a link to the code. All right, thank you very much. We've got plenty of time for questions. Okay. I mean, have you tried this on any criminal justice data? <laughs> we haven't yet, no. Okay. Um, so one thing we're interested in is kind of expanding the experimental section. Um, so we're also interested in seeing if we can um, work with some like facial data sets and things like that. Like the celeb A data set is used a lot in related literature. Uh, and then and data sets like that as well are things we're interested in. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of theoretical work on a seemingly related topic, which is the influence of Boolean variables on Boolean functions, right? It, it, have you looked into that literature and see if it connects at all? Um, I haven't looked at that uh, literature very much, but I'd be like really interested to hear and uh, hear what you have to say about that. It, it's under the influence and under sensitivity. Yeah. No, uh, if you, if you look at keywords, yeah. it's the sensitivity of a function to Boolean, maybe also to it, yeah. Boolean functions. Yeah, I, I definitely love to, to hear what you have to say about that. All right, so we can uh, continue all these discussions over lunch. Thank you. Thank you.